Welcome to Cutting Edge Pain Relief. And today we're talking about a topic that is interesting, but also a bit controversial. And that is gene therapy and pain relief. So initially, when we talk about a topic such as this, it really sparks a lot of things of um, issues with challenging patients, their people, and how genes can be used for nefarious means, um, means that change who that person happens to be. And that's a lot of concerns. What we're going to talk about today is not to discard those thoughts. We're going to lean into that and have a little bit of that discussion. But more importantly, what we're going to talk about is what is some of the science that might provide benefit for those people who think that this may be something that they want to avail themselves of. If you haven't joined us before, welcome. Uh, this is Cutting Edge Pain Relief. One of the things that we do is to try to be able to provide options for patients to understand what's out there, how it might be able to benefit them or someone that they care about, and really to know how to be able to take their lives back and how to be able to deal with conditions that prevent them from being able to lead their lives to their fullest. So how I came across this topic um, actually was by looking at an article like this. And it was an old cancer drug may have purpose treating chronic pain. And how it came about was in looking through that article, it was this following snippet is that a number of researchers at Duke had found a new medication, which was actually an old medication. It was a cancer drug that was found to have an impact on the genetic switches that control neurotransmission. So what that means in regular English is how nerves communicate with one another. And that nerve communication was basically, it had a way to be able to impact pain signals, but it wasn't just temporarily, but it was able to change the mechanism that caused the pain sensation. So let me kind of repeat that. For our patients that have chronic pain that's significant, that's unremitting, that's just giving a constant searing pain ongoing, there is a drug that's a cancer drug that has potential utility in order to be able to stop that. That's not an opioid without an addictive component that doesn't necessarily even change that person outside of that area. And it may be able to give somebody's life back, right? And so that's what kind of fostered um, looking into this topic a little bit more. And so before we talk about that specific element, let's really kind of get into the following question. And that is, what is really gene therapy? So gene therapy is simply the following, if you were to take a look at this picture, and that is you have a gene that has, or rather you have a cell that has a defective gene, and what you're looking to do is to be able to introduce a healthy gene in order to be able to get restoration of typical cell function, right? By the way, if you have questions and you're joining us during the live stream, shoot them to me. Let me know. So that way I can be able to answer those questions and give you insight about um, what it is that we're talking about and how we can be able to make sure we're all on the same page. So there's another paper that looked at gene therapy in our context, which is specifically for chronic pain. And one of the things that it talked about is the following, is that there are gene therapies that can be able to do a number of different things. First, is it can be able to replace a disease that's caused by a gene with a healthy, healthy copy of the gene. Second is that it can be able to inactivate a disease causing gene that is not functioning properly. And finally, it can be a way of introducing a new or modified gene to the body to help treat a disease. And there are different ways to be able to utilize this. Most of this is focused on cancer issues um, and some elements of infectious disease. So when we talk about the mechanism behind how this is done, and we're going to kind of show you some cartoon representations, so don't let all the science words become too daunting and for you to feel like, you know what, I'm not understanding this. Hang in there with me because we're going to really kind of show you the simplistic way of understanding this. And that is there's different ways to be able to deal with it. So one is to be able to look at something like a plasmid DNA, which is a circular DNA molecule 
that is able to be able to in be introduced and carry therapeutic genes into human cells. The second and probably more common is viral vectors, where you have a virus that is able to be able to deliver genetic material into cells. The third is bacteria can be used um, to be able to introduce that material. The other ways of doing it is using he human gene editing technology. And then finally, a patient derives cellular therapy products. And so cells are removed from the patient. They're modified uh, using a viral vector many times and then returned to the patient. So I know all of that sounds incredibly fancy and probably looking like, well, this is going somewhere off into the future. But when we talk about this from a cartoon representation, it looks like the following. You have a vector that's outside the area of the cell, traditionally using an adenovirus of some sort. And then you take that DNA that's been placed within that component of that injector and it's inserted within the area of the cell to then be able to get a transition the way that you want it to be. So when we talk about pain specifically, one of the things that we see is that the brain can have that sensation of pain through a number of different neurons up through the spinal cord, and that is mediated by ion channels. And so again, ion channels are channels that allow for different molecules to pass through, and those molecules can cause an action potential or in essence cause that um, neuron to quote unquote light up, right? Sometimes you want that and sometimes you don't. With chronic pain, that pain, that pathway rather can become hyperactive. And what we want to be able to do at times is to be able to address that hyperactivity. And a way to deal with that is by using different type of treatment options, i.e. if you heard of something that's called CRISPR. And CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Pound genomic repeats, which is a really fancy way to talk about way to be able to target genes in a specific and direct approach. But when we talk about it from a pain standpoint, by us influencing those channels, there's ways for us to get a response. And there's a lot of different ways to influence those channels. You can influence them by, as mentioned before, taking cellular components, changing those cellular components, and then reintroducing it back to the person. You can be able to use different type of vectors, either in vivo or ex vivo, meaning inside the body or outside the body to be able to carry it. There are ways for us to be able to target it specifically within the neuronal area where you either go within the area around the spinal cord, outside of it at the dorsal root ganglion that we've talked about before, even into the nerve root or possibly into the muscle in order to get responses. How would this possibly help us? Well, for instance, let's say you have osteoarthritis that's significant in nature. There may be ways to be able to improve the issues that are going with arthritis in meniscal areas. Are any of these things ongoing right now? No, they're not. But are they potentially on the horizon? Yeah, they are. And there's a number of different studies that are looking at musculoskeletal, meaning bone and joint type issues, as well as neuronal issues to figure out, can this be a therapy that can provide benefit? So we talk about pain specifically, genetic factors account for about 30 to 76% of the differences that are seen in the pain response, as well as how someone feels pain and how susceptible they are to chronic pain. And so some of the things that have been identified as some of the causative agents are these channels that we talked about before, specifically voltage-gated sodium channels. And there's a lot of different ones. You can see their subtypes that are listed underneath here. And when you have mutations in these channels, it can potentially cause hyperexcitability that we talked about before. So if we take a look at this one paper, it talks about there's a specific type of channel that you can see here that plays or potentially plays a significant role in chronic pain. And by dealing with this channel, patients sometimes can experience extreme constant pain or they can't feel any pain at all. So if there's a way for us to be able to address that channel, which there is, you can be able to improve that area by, pardon me, that channel by introducing a way to replicate it either in a positive way so that it's um, improved and that it doesn't have that same degree of excitability that we talked about before. 
So these different slides talk about different ways to influence those therapeutic pieces, whether you use it, as mentioned before, with that plasmid DNA, whether you use those viral or bacterial ve vectors to be able to do that type of treatment. So let's take a step back and kind of talk about this and how people perceive um, gene therapy. And so one of the things that was done um, in a couple of different papers were really looked at how do people perceive gene therapy? And a number of individuals kind of feel like, you know, it's going too far, it's going against nature. And that the therapies that um, we're talking about in terms of just doing something aesthetic or enhancement, it's just too much. But what about therapies for serious or fatal diseases, things that are neurodegenerative in nature where you use the, lose the ability to be able to control your emotion or control your um, bowel or bladder or things along those lines where you can't move. And a good number of patients would say about 35% that that might be potentially useful. And patients that have issues with blindness that might be genetic, 93% said that maybe there might be a value. This might be a value. So when we talk about pain, although we're in its infancy at this point in time, I think that that's a conversation that really should be had by each individual to figure out, is this something that you feel comfortable with? Or is this something that you don't feel comfortable with? And being able to honor and respect those wishes and make it a personalized decision about would this be something that you entertain? And if so, is it specific upon the context that it's utilized in? The other thing that makes this probably one of the most challenging things is the price tag that's associated with it. So for instance, right now there's a gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and that drug right now is probably the world's most expensive drug. And that's at 2.1 million. And currently the gene therapies that are out there are priced at more than 30 times the average household income. And so when that is a solution that might be a novel solution that may prevent someone from needing surgery, that may prevent you from having to have uh, you know, a, a multi-systemic treatment option via infusion, but it's priced at such a high price point that really is limiting for a lot of people. And when we talk about gene therapy as a whole, this is where things get complicated to say, number one, is it ethical? Number two, is it a right thing for me or for the person I care about? Number three is what are the safety elements that are in place and how can we be able to make sure that that's focused on just the area that we're interested in and involved in? And number four, does it make any sense from a cost standpoint? And I think all of those things have yet to be worked out. but as you start having researchers really focus on, particularly for those patients that have a chronic pain issue, those sodium channels that are defective, that have that hyperexcitability and are able to hone in in terms of not having to be reliant on things like gabapentin or Lyrica or Cymbalta or those type of medications that focus on those channels that have those issues. And you can be able to do this from traditionally a treatment option that then doesn't make you reliant on medicines that can hopefully improve that condition, it may be something to consider. So what we wanted to be able to do is to kind of give you some semblance of where things are progressing to and how it might be of value to you. If you have degenerative treatment options or treatment issues, i.e. things like osteoarthritis where your cartilage is having problems or issues. Most of the time, that's not just from a mechanical wear and tear, as we assume, but there's susceptibility to having other issues that make your cartilage and other portions more likely to be able to have um, less robustness. And by identifying a way to be able to improve that, and particularly in a targeted fashion, also sooner than what that disease progression starts with can be able to help ward off or improve a condition before it really develops in full. So I'm Dr. Orlando Landrum from Cutting Edge Pain Relief. I wanted to be able to provide an initial beginning understanding of genetic therapies, particularly in the context of pain and musculoskeletal treatment. For those of you who have watched this currently or watching in the future, please leave comments about what your thoughts, whether you think it might be something that might be a fit for you, or someone you care about, or there's something you're like, no, I'd never do anything like that. Um, and if there are topics that you want to cover or want us to discuss further within this realm, please let us know. 
and let us have an idea about how we can be able to help you figure out how to be able to punch pain in the face and get back to leading the life that you deserve. Again, thank you for joining and watching this video.